You're listening to After Images, a podcast for cinephiles that takes a deep dive into moving images. Each episode features a special guest who is invited to explore a film of their choice. After Images is hosted by film writers Franck Bouleg and Marisa C. Hayes. Welcome to our special end of the year episode. As 2023 draws to a close, we celebrate the first year of After Images podcast by welcoming back Ramsey Campbell, Miranda Corcoran, Stephen Volk, Lindsay Hallam, Harley Payton, and Amber Sparks to discuss their favorite moving images seen in 2023. These films and series were not necessarily released in 2023, although some of them were, but rather represent a delightful array of moving images across diverse eras and countries of production. This collective episode is split into three segments of roughly 30 minutes each. To open the episode, I'd like to ask my co-host Marissa, what was your favorite film or series in 2023? Thanks for asking, Frank. There were many noteworthy series and films, of course, but I think here I'll mention a special Argentinian film that I was fortunate to catch on the big screen and that also happens to be part of Les Cahiers du Cinéma's top 10 as well. And that film is Trinque Laucaen, directed by Laura Citarella. It's a fabulous two-part film clocking in at over four hours. And it's ostensibly a mystery about the disappearance of a botanist named Laura. But the actual investigative trail becomes a sort of initiation journey without end on which mysteries multiply and veer into the realm of the supernatural or science fiction, but while maintaining a sense of detective fiction and adventure. And if this reminds you of Twin Peaks, you're not far off, although the flavor I think is distinctively Latino. It's an open-ended Borges-like tale with plenty of room for interpretation, and it's fabulously written and acted. And I'd also give a special mention this year to Zalbat Manglij and Britt Marling's A Murder at the End of the World, which is an intricately woven mystery for our AI preoccupied times. What about you, Frank? What moving images impressed you in 2023? Okay, so I've got three, including Tranquil Larquin, that you've just mentioned. In no particular order, my other favorites were Tar by Todd Field, which I really appreciated for its multi-layered nature and the fact that it can be read as a ghost story of sorts, contrary to uh, the way most critics have focused on the film's identity politics. Um, what caught my attention was the various spectral layers at work in the film. The second film was Slashback, uh, a Canadian Inuit film by Naila Inuksuk that defies genres by merging elements of science fiction, horror, the slasher, with indigenous storytelling. And the film's feminist outlook and a humorous approach are outstanding, and we look forward to welcoming Naila Inuksuk on our podcast in 2024. Great, thank you. And now, let's hear from our guests. Uh, Ramsey Campbell, Miranda Corcoran, welcome back to After Images. We're so happy to be chatting with you today at the end of 2023. As the year draws to a close, we're really happy to hear from you what films or television series really marked you this year. Um, so this is the opportunity to hear from you about any moving images that really struck you this year. And I suppose we will start with Ramsey Campbell. Welcome back, Ramsey. Hey, thanks for having me back. So, Ramsey, please tell us about uh, the film or TV series that really left an impression with you uh, in 2023, old or new. Well, I've got to confess that there were several I had to choose from. Um, I mean, for instance, the movie Speak No Evil um, left me and Jenny, my wife, shaken uh, by the end in a way very few films have these days. I felt that extremely powerful. It's a... It starts like almost a kind of Mike Lee comedy of, of of politeness, and then it turns into something very considerably darker. And apparently, that that is how it was uh, how it was made. It was originally supposed to be that kind of a film, but then they followed it to its its horrendously inevitable end. 
I was also very taken with the, with the movie Where Evil Lurks, which is a, a supernatural horror film with, with of considerable inventiveness. But my, my movie of the year, all things considered, and I've seen it twice, um, is Ari Aster's new one, uh, Bo is Afraid. I don't know, will you have seen that yourselves at all? Yes, yes, we, we did. Oh, good. So we, we're going to talk about it a little bit then. Good, good. Um, well, what, what can we say about it? Um, is it, for instance, a, a fantasy from the womb or does it take place in the afterlife? Um, both possibilities seem to me to be reasonable. And both occurred to me while I was watching it for the first time, after which um, I, I sought out some interviews with the writer-director online. And there's one given at the Lincoln Centre where he curated uh, a selection of films that he felt were in some way a background to Bo is Afraid. Now, I, 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 I'm afraid I have shamefacedly to confess there are several on his list I actually haven't seen yet. Though obviously, now I shall go and see them. But three did strike me as being especially significant. So we have The Birds, the Hitchcock, um, which he interprets as being very much a projection of the mother's paranoia about being separated from her son. And certainly I think you can read Bo is Afraid very, very fruitfully in those terms. Um, he had Jacques Tati's Playtime, um, which I think you can see mostly in terms of the of, of, of the sheer inventiveness of, of the backgrounds in some of his setups, above all the opening scene in the city, um, the opening section actually. Um, and finally, A Matter of Life and Death, the Powell and Pressburger movie. Now, he says it was only the, the tribunal at the end of that film that was, you know, the influence of the tribunal at the end of his film. Mm -hmm. But I, I do think it's significant that you know, that tribunal in the Powell and Pressburger takes place in the afterlife. And it seems that we, we can argue that um, that maybe that's that's one of the things that's happening to poor old Bo, who, um, incidentally, I think uh, Joaquin Phoenix, am I pronouncing him correctly, is absolutely magnificent. I think one of the most astonishing performances I've seen for some... Well, everybody's very fine in the film, um, but, but his performance is just extraordinary. Apparently he fainted in the course of giving it at, at what point, so we're told. Um, mm. So let, let's 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 sort of um, give a bit of a sense of of how the film plays out. Uh, it, it, it begins with a birth scene, seen initially from inside the womb, um, and then immediately after the, I think we do get a credit, um, the title at least, uh, and we then shift into um, the first of four sections, each of which we can argue um, are preceded by a shift of, of consciousness. Actually, the, 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 all the ones within the film after the credits, uh, a, a loss of consciousness. So again, you know, each of which can be possibly <laughs> um, regarded as, as, as being a sort of glitch in, 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 his, in, his, in his life or the end of his life, if, you, if it even starts at all. Because clearly the film does end up, uh, uh, you know, uh, the aerobrous principle with, you know, with its tail in its mouth. You, you can argue that he returns to the womb at the end, uh, except that this uh, experience is the very opposite of reassuring. Um, now, that, that opening section in the, well, the opening section actually begins with, with, his, with his therapist, which uh, who will take on a, a, an ominous significance as the film progresses, as, as nearly everything does. And there's a, a remarkable amount of foreshadowing and echoing it within the film. Um, but, but once we get out of the psychiatrist, I think about the, the therapist's office, um, we go into what I think is the finest comedy of paranoia I've ever seen in any film at all. I mean, it is horribly funny and, and deeply disturbing. I mean, I think possibly Orson Welles' uh, film of the trial intermittently comes close, but I think, you know, Astor trumps him. And I hope this doesn't sound too self-regarding. But I actually felt it was very much like some of my own stuff. I mean, I've I've, I've often thrown around the term nightmare comedy, mm -hmm. and I was very struck to find Astor in his Lincoln Centre lecture uh, referring to his films in exactly the same with exactly the same term. And it, incidentally, he regards all his films as comedy, including Hereditary and uh, Midsummer, which is, uh, well, one may say a disconcerting view of them, but I can see what he means. I can certainly see far more what he means in, in terms of Bo is Afraid. Mm -hmm. So we, we then get several, as I say, several sections of successive sections of the film, each of which I think contains a, a mother substitute, a father substitute, um, a sibling figure in some ways, 
Um, so there's there is the, the the couple who rescue him, the, the apparently idyllic domestic environment, which has some astonishing stuff with the decor. I mean, you think you could write a thesis on the backgrounds in this film alone? And I mean, the uh, the 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 young the the teenage daughter's room is, I think, worthy of worthy of the Kubrick of Clockwork Orange in its own way. I think you know, as, a, as a sort of a decor joke, if you like, which is a serious joke, as all the film is. Mm. Uh, we get the theatre in the forest that he meets, which again, which 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 begins apparently to enact his life, and then. Then what does it do? What do we think it does? It then it then enacts a life that he has never had and has never liked it to have for reasons that become more apparent later on. And we finally have his return home, um, which is which is uh, again sort of modulates into nightmare comedy. And it's one of the many things that we can spot in the background, apart from the mother's face, appears to be made up. The huge portrait of the mother. I think, you know, as far as we can see, the, the glimpse we get, it's almost certainly composed of all the characters within the film. Um, and we then see that the housing project that her, her firm is responsible for is in fact where he lives. And it's about the housing project for people who have abused the substances that her uh, presumably advertising firm has, has helped to promote, often using images of him. And I think, you know, I've said all this, I've only just really scratched the surface. What have I missed, do you think? I don't know if you've missed something, but I was, like you, very struck by this um, mix of comedy and and and, and scary aspects mm. of the film. And you never know if you are supposed to laugh or to be scared by what you see. And um, you probably are supposed to do both at the same time. Uh, uh, yes. And this puts you in a very uncanny situation as the watcher, um, mm. because there's this uh, undecidability that is there constantly, and that uh, is uh, very um, shaking the ground under you. Mm. Well, yes, in fact, I, 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 even more than that, that occasionally you get it within the same image. Um, yeah. I mean, there's that extraordinary scene where he's he's talking. Well, again, there are so many references in the film that we could. Well, I'm sure we could take an hour on it, but we can't. I know that. Um, but I mean, the 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 the, the lawyer uh, who he rings, apparently thinking that he's a doctor for reasons mm -hmm. that you know we 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 must only uh, suppose. Um, while he's talking, there's a very a very moving uh, scene on the phone about his mother's death. Um, in the background, there's this virtual slapstick going on mm. with, with the, the army veteran whom the, the couple have adopted. It's within the same scene. So what do we do with the, this juxtaposition of image emotionally? I don't know. And I think it's the, not the only moment in the film where that happened. Yes. And you might recall that we often ask people when they come on the podcast, why did you choose this film? So mm. you beautifully described um, the complex construction of the film and mm -hmm. begun to dive into some of the many layers that we find in the film. Would you say that aside from this brilliant construction that obviously you know intrigues you and, and probably moves you, is there mm -hmm. another reason on a more emotional level that the, the film speaks to you? Yes, it reminded me of my childhood, basically. <laughs> yes, I mean, I know it's to some extent about, you know, supposed to be specifically Jewish, well, not specifically, well, the film is specifically about a Jewish experience. I mean, that's made abundantly clear. And, and you know, his mother turns out to be the, perhaps the ultimate nightmare Jewish mm -hmm. mother, you know, I think, and, uh, he intends it that way, I'm quite sure. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, specific visual Jewish references within the film, as there are, and I know I'm spinning off on a tangent here in American Werewolf in London, but you, they're only there visually if you if you, you happen to spot them, usually in the background of a shot. Um, but yes, I mean, I it just rang horribly true to me in terms of of the you know um, how I grew up in some ways, even though I'm not not Jewish, but of course you know the 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 basic psychological setup can be you know is pretty universal i think Mm -hmm. It actually made me think a lot of um, that film from the 1980s, I think, called by Bad Boy Bobby. There is yes, a, a yes. link, I think, there um, um, about the relationship with the mother. And at the same time, um, it is more humorous and um, dystopian. And that um, made me think of Brazil. Uh, mm, yeah. Yeah, I thought it was a mix of uh, both uh, universes. I don't know if uh, you would agree with that. I think so. Yes, I think all those elements are there, and I mean the 
Uh, yes, I mean, I, I think it, 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 he's clearly open to admitting his influences. I don't think he's named those as such, but it's entirely possible he's seen those movies and, you know, in some way they've percolated into his creative consciousness. Hmm. Hmm. And Miranda, have you seen the film as well? You know, unfortunately, I haven't yet. Oh. It it got about two days at my local art house theatre um, oh. and I missed it. So it, it didn't get a very good run here. So I'm waiting for it to to come out either on home media or streaming. Actually, it might be available on DVD now, but I'm looking forward to it. I enjoyed uh, both Hereditary and Midsummer a lot. And I can actually really see what Ramsey was saying about Ari Aster viewing his films as comedies, yeah. um, because even in Hereditary, which you know is a very, very dark, very intense film, there is a very, very strange black humor to it. You know, mm -hmm. even that, you know, that grueling scene where, where the little girl sticks her head out the window of the yeah. car and, you know, uh, we know what happens. But, you know, there's a great dark humor. So I'm looking forward to it. And actually hearing you guys talk about some of the possible influences has made me even more eager to see it. Yeah, it, it, it really reminds me also of the Jewish humor that uh, Ramsey Campbell was uh, mentioning. And uh, I, I know that one. That, that, that some of his favorite film directors are the Cohen brothers, and there's also their link, I think, uh, that can be found. Makes sense, makes sense. Mm. Would you like to add something about the film, Ramsey Campbell? Uh, I know it's a bit short to discuss such a film in 15 sure. minutes, but is there another element of the film that you'd like to let us know about? Well, I mean, I, 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 basically, I'm only having, you know, survived it. Uh, uh, but I actually have now managed to see it twice. Um, my, my sense of it is probably inexhaustible in the way that, you know, something like uh, Tati's Playtime is 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 completely inexhaustible. I mean, every time you see it, you see something new. And I'm, I'm and this is why I really, I, think, I feel I've, I've been only giving you a very superficial view of it. And there are, there are many, many more things that are going to, fall into place next time around. So basically, I exhort everybody to go and watch it as, as soon as you can. And I, I mean, I, I did have it on, on Blu-ray, um, <laughs> but I don't think it's released here quite yet. But it has been in France, certainly. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. No, it's such a beautiful open work. Um, mm -hmm. Open work in the sense that the viewer is really working through the film as well and mm. travels I think throughout this film and puts pieces together and I think for audience members who are intrigued and who appreciate this style of work they won't be disappointed so thank you so much for suggesting it and for discussing it with us. My pleasure, my pleasure. Thank you very much uh, Ramsey Campbell and now we're moving to Mir Miranda Cochran's choice which is my choice is the 1980 film Times Square, which is a very unusual choice for me, probably, um, because I, I do a lot of podcasts. I do a lot of video essays and DVD commentaries and things like that, in addition to my, my academic work. And I'm pretty much always talking about either horror or something kind of horror adjacent. So this is kind of unusual because it's a coming of age drama with musical elements. Uh, so it's it's very different to what I would normally be discussing, but it's a film that I saw for the first time this year, uh, despite it obviously not being a, re a recent film. It was released in 1980. And the, re the reason I stumbled across it was because a number of um, friends of mine were working on the recent uh, Kino Lorber release of the film. So there's been a recent DVD release and a number of friends of mine were working on it, uh, either doing video essays or commentaries. And I just kept seeing them talking about this film on social media and something about it really appealed to me, particularly the kind of late 70s, early 80s New York setting and that like very gritty texture that you get in New York films of that period. So I decided I would check it out and I loved it. And I, I loved the film and I loved the soundtrack and I've been listening to the soundtrack continuously. I, I, I tracked down the playlist on Spotify and I've been listening like anytime I'm walking anywhere the last couple of weeks, last couple of months, I've been listening to that soundtrack. Uh, so it's a film that I just absolutely loved. It's, you know, it's not a particularly complex film in terms of its narrative. It's about two teenage girls from very different backgrounds. A young girl called Nikki, who's sort of grown up on the streets of New York and comes from a very kind of a, a very tough, impoverished background and a wealthier young girl um, called um, Pamela Pearl, which is a great alliterative name, uh, who comes from a very wealthy background and her father is actually the mayor's commissioner in charge of cleaning up um, 42nd Street in Times Square. So it's set during that period when 
42nd Street was, you know, known for being very sleazy, for being filled with porno theaters and pimps and prostitutes and drug dealers. And uh, so it's, it's set at that time. And these two girls meet while undergoing psychiatric and neurological tests in a hospital ward. And they basically run away together and um, live on the streets of New York. Um, but as part of that, they sort of go on this journey of I, I guess you could say journey of self-discovery which sounds a little bit cheesy but it also has this really interesting artistic component where they sort of come into themselves as like as burgeoning artists so Pamela the girl from quite a wealthy background she writes poetry and you know based on her relationship with Pamela Nikki starts writing poetry as well which she turns into songs and the two of them kind of begin engaging kind of bizarre performance art as well uh, they start forming really strange songs on the radio. They start knocking televisions off of the roofs of um, skyscrapers or high rise buildings as a way of sort of protesting against kind of the blandness and the homogeny of middle class culture. So it's a film that I love because it has this great sort of punk sensibility to it. Uh, in terms of its setting, you know, it's New York, late 70s, early 80s. So it's kind of, you know, it's it's the New York of like, of things like Dog Day Afternoon and the French Connection, but it's also the New York of things like The Warriors and Driller Killer and Maniac and things like that. So it's got that great kind of sleaziness to it, which I really, really loved. And it's got a fantastic kind of punk, post-punk new wave soundtrack as well. So the sound, so the film opens, um, Sort of with the camera following Nikki through the streets of New York through like 42nd Street, that sort of area. The song in the background is uh, Roxy Music's Same Old Scene. Uh, when the girls run away from the hospital together, they run away with that uh, Nikki's radio blasting, I Want to Be Sedated by the Ramones. Um, they, they start dancing in the street at one point and this kind of very unusual cohort of people join in including like some of the local pimps and drug dealers but they start dancing to life during wartime uh by the talking heads so it's got this great like punk soundtrack um and also this excellent sort of punk sensibility in the in the sense i guess that these girls sort of find themselves and express themselves and express their anger and their frustration with the restrictions that have been placed on them through art and through music and I think that's what I really like about it I mean the other thing about this film as well is that it was meant to be a lesbian love story so I, I don't know have you have you guys had a chance to see it or yes good did you like it oh yeah we loved, loved it, it. Hmm. Brilliant. <laughs> yeah so it, it, you might have noticed watching the film it feels like stuff is missing uh like when they leave the hospital at Pearl Pamela Pearl she still has the very long thick black hair and we see her again She's got short, chopped red hair. And that's because there was apparently a scene where the girls, like, after they've run away, they exchange clothes and they cut and dye their hair. Um, and the director, Alan Moyle, intended it to be a lesbian love story. Or at least, I guess the two performers were very young. They were about 13 and 15. So it was meant to be a sort of a coming of age film with these two girls discovering who they were as people and as artists, but also sort of coming into their sexuality and falling in love for the first time. But the film's producer, uh, Robert, he was Robert Stigwood, and he sort of, he'd made a name for himself previously by uh, producing films like Grease and Saturday Night Fever and stuff like that. And he wanted another sort of big commercial success. So he basically asked them to cut anything that, was too overt in gesturing towards a lesbian relationship between the girls. So parts of the film are missing, but at the same time, you can still see it. Like the, the relationship growing between them has very, very clear uh, queer elements. And, you know, I think, you know, I, I love that sort of element of, I guess, a really unique, like I said, coming of age film. And also like, I'm a sucker for 70s, 80s New York films. Like I love films set in New York during that period of like the fiscal crisis and, you know, kind of the, the mushrooming crime rates in New York because they always have this sort of gritty, grainy, dirty texture that reflects the kind of the socioeconomic setting of New York at the time. I just, I love how films of that period transmute that to the screen. Uh, but a lot of those kinds of films, you know, again, things like Dog Day Afternoon and The Warriors, they're great films, but a lot of them are very sort of male centric. So it was really interesting to find a film 
about two teenage girls running around this, you know, insane, you know, late 70s, early 80s, crime ridden, dirty version of New York and finding freedom in that setting. And I just I really loved that element. So I think I might have asked answered your question and maybe some other questions additionally, because um, I think I'm, I might have gone on a number of tangents there, but I really loved it. I think it's a wonderful film. No, that's great. And we were so happy to discover it thanks to your recommendation because we weren't familiar with the film at all. And I was surprised to see that Alan Moyle had directed Empire Records, which yeah. was an important sort of coming of age film for me in the 90s when I was a teenager. Um, but it was great to go back to this film. I mean, this film, I think, is an incredible gem that is really not much talked about, but perhaps that's going to change with the the release of this new Blu-ray or DVD that's coming out. Um, but it's just such a forward thinking film for the time. I really cannot think of a teenage uh, lesbian finding yourself artistic identity, punk spirit, from 1980, I can't think of something earlier than that that really starts to tell this story that will become such a kind of um, classic model, I think, going forward. So it's really, really ahead of its time, I think. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very unusual, I think, in that sense. And one of the things I liked about it is the way it views New York and the way it views 42nd Street and that whole Times Square area, because obviously, a lot of people in the 70s and 80s obviously, you know, viewed that particular setting with a lot of anxiety and a lot of paranoia surrounding kind of increasing crime rates. It was a period of sort of unprecedented white flight where middle class white New Yorkers were sort of fleeing en masse to the suburbs and just sort of letting the city crumble behind mm -hmm. them. So people tended to view the city very negatively. And you see that in a lot of films of that period, you know, the emphasis is on crime and violence in New York. Mm -hmm. And a lot of films really sensationalize that. But what I really like about the film Times Square is that it actually kind of treats 42nd Street and treats New York as this kind of artistic crucible almost where these two girls can find freedom to express themselves. And you know, at the beginning, Pamela is, you know, her daughter is the mayor, or sorry, her father is the mayor's commissioner. Uh, she's, you know, the first time we see her, she's wearing like a private school uniform. She has her head down. She's very, very quiet and very repressed. And it's only when she runs away to the city with Nikki that she's really able to explore her identity, both as an artist, but also potentially a sort of burgeoning queer identity. And New York City, and again, that whole 42nd Street area, is this really sort of generative space where the girls encounter all of these different people. And the film doesn't present that with anxiety, like the kind of sort of racism and classism that you see in a lot of films of that period is very absent. They're sort of mingling with all sorts of people from all kinds of different backgrounds. You know, they they make friends with, you know, pimps and prostitutes. Um, Pamela gets a job dancing in a topless bar, but she refuses to dance topless because, you know, she's not 18. Ah, she's only a, she's only a teenager. She refuses to dance topless and she comes out and she does this like really bizarre kind of silly dance while wearing a homemade tutu. And initially all the patrons in this topless bar are kind of like, OK, what the hell is this? And they're kind of laughing. But then she gets into it. She, she looks at Nikki. She makes eye contact with Nikki and she kind of starts dancing with her. And all of a sudden, all the patrons just sort of get behind it and start clapping and cheering and then later on in the film you just see these two teenage girls hanging out in this you know sleazy topless bar uh doing I don't it's not quite their homework but like uh Pamela is like writing her poems and they're just like hanging out and hanging out there and it feels like kind of the owner and the patrons are really taking care of them so I really like that and there's another great scene where they're running away from a police officer and he chases them into a porno theater, which, you know, like the ubiquitous scourge of 42nd Street in the in the 70s and 80s. He chases them into a porno theater and all the patrons kind of, again, get behind the girls and are kind of like, yeah, you go. And at one point they tackle the police officer uh, as he's trying to catch the girls. So it's really interesting how they find this kind of support in a community that at the time was so maligned in in mainstream American culture. And it. It reminded me a lot of, I don't know if you guys know the, the science fiction writer Samuel Orr Delaney. Oh, yeah. He has, yeah, he has this fantastic book. Um, it's kind of part memoir, part essay called Times Square Red, Times Square Blue. 
Uh, and part of it is like his mem kind of a memoir of his experiences as a queer man going to the porno theaters in 42nd Street and the different guys he would meet there. But part of it is also kind of more of a, a think piece style essay where he reflects on the on the dynamic social interactions that were taking place in 42nd Street mm -hmm. before the porno theaters were cleared, before it was, you know, cleaned up in, in quotation marks, basically before it was gentrified. Mm -hmm. um, and he talks about how Times Square at that at that period in the 70s and 80s, even though there was so much paranoia surrounding it and surrounding crime and sexuality, it was actually this really dynamic space where people from different racial, ethnic and socioeconomic backgrounds could come together and meet. And he says that, you know, following the, the demolition, essentially, the, you know, of Times Square and of 42nd Street, that that doesn't really exist in New York anymore. Now, it's much more stratified in terms of things like class and race. And, you know, if you've been to New York, like at all, um, in, and I, like, obviously, I, I've never I've never seen New York in the in the 70s and 80s. I've only been there from about two, yeah, the 2000s onwards. And it's like if you go to like that midtown area around Times Square now, it doesn't feel like anyone lives there. It feels mm. like a theme park because it's been so, so gentrified yeah. and so and it's become so expensive that like no one can live there. It's just all hotels and, you know, attractions and things. Um, but the film reminds me a lot of of that essay and the idea that actually in this area that, you know, a lot of, you know, maybe middle and upper class white Americans might associate with crime and with, you know, danger. There's yeah. actually this like really dynamic culture. And that's, I think what I really like about the film, uh, the way those girls find freedom in this culture that is, you know, in many ways, so maligned uh, by mainstream American culture and had by, you know, by the eighties become this kind of source of moral panic almost yeah. in the U S. I'm going to confess, I was in uh, New York and you know, visiting the 75, 76 and later. I actually found Times Square very exciting. You know, I mean, you could, you know, hear your toolbox murders and Umberto Lenzi movies and, you know, City of the Living Dead, that sort of thing. And of course, it, it seemed, it, yeah, it's, it seemed like it was really, you know, quite exciting. And again, like, obviously, I can say this as, you know, someone who lives in Ireland in the 21st century. Um, and I'm very far removed from that. But like, it seemed like there was an excitement and something mm. I think kind of powerful generated by the fact that there were so many different people from so yeah. many different backgrounds interacting there. And like, if you go there now, it's just like, it's a Disney shop and there's an M&M &M mm. shop. And like, <laughs> yeah, it's just, good. it's just like, yeah. I've been once, I've been to Times Square once. I, I've been back to New York a couple of times since for work and stuff, but yeah. I never went back to that part of the city because it just, uh, it feels so hollow. Yeah. Um, but yeah. I think, like it actually, I think if, if Times Square reminds me of anything, the, the movie Times Square, um, I would say that it reminds me a lot of Patti Smith's memoir, Just Kids, mm -hmm. where she talks about, you know, her burgeoning relationship with Robert Maplethorpe and kind of the excitement of New York and finding yourself in the city mm -hmm. in that period um, of kind of like the set of the 1970s. So I think if, if it reminds me of anything, if I if I were to like try and recommend it or sum it up to people, I would say if you like uh, just Kids by Patti Smith, you'll probably like this movie. Yeah, yeah. And it's not by accident that she's part of the soundtrack as well. Yes, yeah, I know. A fantastic <laughs> use of Patti Smith, actually, during a very emotional scene. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, it's just as you said, this film really made me nostalgic for the New York of my childhood in the 80s when there was a real bohemia remaining in New York, which is not the case today, but it was still a creative capital at the time in terms of the possibility to be able to live there, to make work and to find yourself as the as the girls begin to do in, in the film. So thank you so much for this wonderful discovery. And we've had, I think, a, a great discussion of two very complex films. There's so much more to say, I think, about both of them. We could spend hours on each of them. Do you want to add anything, Frank? Um, no, except that I, I really enjoyed watching both films. Uh, perhaps we were, uh, we were discussing this with uh, Marisa uh, before we started um, recording the podcast. Um, they, they were not on our watching list, at least for the coming weeks or months. So we are very happy to have uh, been able to um, discover those films, thanks to you. So thank you very much. Uh, it was um, really, um, it brought us a lot. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you yeah thanks for having me yeah, it, it was it was great it was great it was it was lovely talking to you both and it was it was lovely to meet you as well Ramsey yeah great to meet you you bet
Welcome to the second segment of our end of the year special episode of After Images. We're joined by two new guests, uh, Stephen Volk and Lindsay Hallam. Hello, Stephen, and hello, Lindsay. Hello, hi. Hi, Frank. Hi. Hi. Uh, Stephen Volk is a screenwriter and novelist, and Lindsay Hallam is a senior lecturer in film at the University of East London. Um, we're going to start with Stephen Volk, uh, who's chosen to tell us about the film Full Circle, or also known as The Haunting of Julia, a film from 1977. So yes, yes. This one's yours. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Um, yes, I'll, I'll just uh, give a very schematic uh, summation of it, um, and then and then a bit of a per personal co uh, connection with it, really. Um, but kind of remarkable, I never saw it on its release in 1978, um, because it was very much the kind of film I would have seen, but somehow it passed me by. When I looked into it, uh, it seemed to have been met with a kind of critical shrug and kind of then very quickly disappeared. And then it kind of vanished from the uh, filmic kind of firmament. Um, you know, in those days, in the 70s, it wasn't a case of finding something online. It wasn't even a case of finding, tracking down the video. It was it, it was, it was kind of gone. Um, uh, and to my delight, uh, this year it was resurrected um, as a BFI Blu-ray with lots of lovely extras, um, a lot supplied by the director, Richard Longcrane. Um, largely, largely it was released due to the efforts of a, of a kind of film historian called Simon Fitzjohn, who I followed online because he, he um, uh, I think I followed him on Twitter, he had a, a, a a thing called full circle so I, uh, and he was kind of like campaigning to get it released which eventually he did but it but it basically meant that I, this film from 1978 i couldn't see until this year um and it, i thought it was terrific i mean for those that haven't seen it the film stars mia farrow as julia the title of uh, peter strobe's original novel was julia um, and it was based on the Peter Strobe novel, which I haven't read, so I can't see how closely it uh, it uh, keeps to it. But basically, Julia flees tragedy um, uh, in the opening of the film, and her quite controlling husband, played by Keir Delea, is that the way how you pronounce it, the Canadian actor? Um, she flees to London, Holland Park to be precise. She befriends uh, Tom Conti, who is an antique dealer, um, it's very much set in that Holland Park, Notting Hill kind of area of London. And she's troubled by apparitions of a blonde haired child. So there's a little bit of a um, echo of Don't Look Now, you know, which, which Frank knows is my favorite film. We've talked about it at length. Um, and this encounter in this house in Holland Park kind of forces her, and I've written this down because someone said it uh, very uh, appositely and briefly, forces her on a strange journey of self-discovery. So I'm not going to give any spoilers because I'd like people to discover um, more about the film. But the two things I really like uh, about about the concept was um, when the when a character reaches the truth, is it going to be is it going to be their illumination or is it going to be their destruction? I'm I'm very wedded to that idea in a, in a kind of horror film. Whether this is a horror film or not, I'm not sure. I think there was a debate between director and actress about whether it was a horror film, whether it was a psychological drama. Um, but I think that was more to do with where Mia Farrow kind of at one point wanted to back out of the film and not do it because she thought she was being associated with horror because of Rosemary's Baby. And I think uh, Richard, I call him Richard because I've actually met him, which I'll tell you about in a minute. Um, he had to persuade her. No, it's not so much a horror film. It's more about uh, psycho psychological. So, so the other thing I like about it is it's kind of like the supernatural and the psychological are almost the same thing. Which Frank, as you know, is my kind of territory and, and the thing I like uh, playing with. Um, but the reason I like it so much, the three three real reasons. One is the soundtrack. Now I say I didn't see it on release, but weirdly I did have the soundtrack LP. Uh, by Colin Towns and it's really superb I used to play it I probably played it 
when I was kind of writing. It's very atmospheric in the way that in the way that the soundtrack of Don't Look Now is very atmospheric and evocative. So it's so it's great kind of writing music. And I kind of played it to death on my record player. But I've discovered in in one of the many notes on the uh, or extras on the Blu-ray that apparently the, the 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 soundtrack kind of existed before the film, and it was one of the reasons that Long Crane wanted to make the film was the soundtrack by Conan Towns. So it kind of stands on its own. As I say, Mia Farrow didn't want to do the supernatural film. Uh, that was another thing that came out in the extras, and the other thing was that the money dropped out at the last minute, as as happens frequently in films, and the producer Peter Fetterman had to rush around and and heroically came up with the money. Um, so it's full of, the Blu-ray is full of nuggets of information. Second thing that I like so much is really the atmosphere. There's a real sense of place about it, not just London, but a specific part of London. There's a sense of space about the house. And I realize how how seldom you get that these days. It's so much now, especially in horror films, that the spaces we're in, are constructed they're either a set or they're kind of movable or cgi can change them but there's something about being in a house that you get to know almost i know it's a cliche but like a character it felt kind of lived in and specific and i really like that about it and of course the other thing i think that mia farrow's presence was really quite mesmerizing i don't think people the only other actress that i would use the word mesmerizing about is probably Deborah Carr in The Innocents. They have that quality that you can't uh, look away from them, really. Um, but the strange connection to me is I met Richard because he was going to direct my screenplay Gothic. Uh, I met him about 1982, and he just made a film called Brimstone and Treacle based on the Dennis Potter uh, play and TV play, and it was starring uh, Sting um that was a specific thing because i went to a screening of it so i can remember exactly when it was but richard was a uh, he was a, a, a kind of renaissance man he was a desktop uh, toy designer um he directed commercials for james garrett and james garrett and partners optioned my script of gothic because they wanted to get into producing films with their stable of commercials directors so we met up and talked about the, the the script. Funny enough, we met in Holland Park, the exact area where where um, uh, uh, Full Circle is is set, set. But the interesting thing about Richard was that he gave me three notes, which I, I think might be interesting. One was he said, uh, "It's a bit, it's not quite talky this film. So why don't you move it all over the house? I mean, not just this room, that room, that room. Go up in the cellar. Go on the roof. Go down." You know, go everywhere, go at the greenhouse, go, you know, he was kind of just anything to keep it visual, which was which was a great note. And the other thing was uh, uh, I had the, the 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 imaginary creature, if you like, in Gothic made up of the uh, uh, really, really impulses from the ghost story book that they read, Byron, Shelley, and etc. The idea was that images from the stories created this. And he said, no, I don't, I don't want that. You want it more more psychological like uh, Edgar Allan Poe it has to be their inner fears not something from a book but their inner fears he said for instance what if Shelley had a fear of being buried alive and I said yeah but he didn't he said yeah but what if he did <laughs> no so it was kind of like that it was through that kind of process uh that that, that the film that you finally see uh, got made he's a wonderful guy to work with he's a real ball of energy and imagination and we worked together again 20 years after that on another film that didn't get made. But he obviously went on to make uh, The Missionary. Uh, he made a film called Wimbledon, The Gathering Storm, uh, about Churchill, played by Albert Finney. He did a film with Harrison Ford. But fun funnily enough, he loved doing comedy, he told me, because he felt that actors really brought comedy alive, and he loved seeing that come alive in front of him. So it's 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 funny because I think of him, if you think of Brimstone and Treacle, is quite gothic in a way and certainly kind of psycho uh, psychodrama. Um, and he had a very a, a great kind of visual eye. So so back then in 1982, he was quite a good choice for gothic, I think. But um, uh, had I known, had I seen Full Circle, that like I say, I hadn't seen it until until this year. <laughs> but it's worth the wait. I hadn't seen it until very recently, too, and I thought it was a very interesting choice coming from you after having um, discussed Don't, Don't Look Now, because as you said, there's a lot 
that um, echoes uh, from one film to the other. Um, uh, it would be a good <laughs> good double bill, yeah. Definitely. Um, and, and both have this very strong sense of place, one about Venice and this one about that house, that place that, that is described as a castle of sorts, actually, by uh, Mia Farrow, if I am correct, at some point in the oh. film. Uh, and, and what's interesting, I think, is that the castle is usually a place that is there to protect you from what's outside. But the danger in this one is inside, actually, isn't it? Oh, that's very gothic, though, isn't it? Uh, mm, definitely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, do, do you know the film, Lindsay? Have you seen it? Um, I haven't seen it. Um, I am quite, I'm mostly aware of it from um, Kayla's book, House of Psychotic Women. She talked about the film quite in depth. And like most films in that book, you you come away just like, I need to see this. And um, mm. the Blu-ray has come out. And I think it's it just highlights how important these Blu-ray releases and how we keep having these physical media releases because... I'm not aware of this being on any streaming service. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Well, I I find it refreshing as well because of the era. Probably betrays my age in a way, but you know, I guess my, you know, for my sins, I guess my favorite films were were in the kind of early to mid seventies, really, or late sixties. That's to do with one's age growing up, you know, and the the formative influences that you have. But I found it lately for some reason going back to those films are, are very refreshing. And even even early 60s films that I haven't seen for a long time, um, the social realist films, which is not my genre, genre at all, but, you know, the Tony Richardson films or, or um, King and Country, the, the Joseph Losey, you know, those those great collaborations with Harold Pinter, Accident and, and uh, uh, The Servant and those kind of things, just the the uh, uh, the craftsmanship that goes into them. And it's kind of. Um, what well, this film in particular, it really brought me up short to think about how the the um the kind of artificiality of modern horror that that for me often takes me out of it. You know, it's almost like as soon as I see CGI, I kind of it it distracts me. And there's something about just relying on the atmosphere and the space and the acting and and the storytelling that is refreshing, you know. Um, and I, th I think when we see it now, it's refreshing too. When someone just says, you know, we're not going to go OTT in Act Three. We're not going to have zombie makeup, and we're not going to have someone crawling on the roof, uh, <laughs> crawling on the ceiling, you know, mm. in the in the kind of recent uh, spate of kind of exorcism films, kind of thing. Um, so refreshing, yeah. I've been reading a lot of um, uh, interviews with with uh, Hitchcock lately because I'm writing a book about uh, his relationship with um, the, the work of David Lynch. And he regularly says that uh, the best sort of camera movement you can have is one that will not be noticed by uh, the audience. And this is pretty much the same thing about the CGI. I mean, the, it only functions yeah, yeah, yeah. when you don't actually see it when you don't notice it. Interestingly, I, I saw a documentary the other day with Billy Wilder, the uh, um, um, Volker Schondorf uh, three-part documentary he did for Arena, and they were talking about um, Ace in the Hole, you know, that film with Kirk Douglas, and the very last shot, uh, Kirk Douglas is drunk and he falls on his face into the camera. <laughs> Mm. And uh, Billy Wilder says, well, it, it, he said, what a what a great shot that is, you know, to finish the mm. film on. Mm. Billy Wilder said, no, I don't like that shot. I don't mm. like it because it calls attention to itself too much. Yes. Mm. And he made the exact same point about, mm. you know, he liked to have the work out the action mm. and, uh, you know, not be too aware of the uh, of what the camera is doing, you know, in order to mm. enable you to watch the story kind of thing. Mm. Well, anyway, thank you for having um, chosen this film. It was a real discovery for me, and it, it really worked with uh, the context of our podcast because we already discussed Rosemary's Baby yeah. with uh, uh, Dr. Marinda Corcoran, and you had discussed Don't Look Now, so there's a real continuity. Oh, uh, fantastic. <laughs> so let me know what you think of it, Lindsay, when you do see it. So now let's um, listen to Lindsay Hallam, who's going to tell us about Poor Things. Oh, uh, yes. So uh, I saw Four Things at the London Film Festival. I went to a media screening. It was a Saturday morning at something like 8.30 a.m., these ludicrously early uh, screenings that they have. And But I just knew I wanted to see it because, unfortunately, I it is not co it's not coming out here until January, which is a real shame. Mm -hmm. um, so, I yeah, so I was, like, 
I had to get myself out of bed at like, I don't know, five in the morning or something to try and get there. Because of course, before the screening, you've got to wait in these ridiculously long queues mm. to try and get a seat. So yeah, it was that, it was that kind of bleary eyed experience. And also at the same time in the midst, and it was the last weekend of the festival. So I'd been work been working a lot. So I'd only been, been to a few media screenings. So, but it was still like, I'd seen a lot of films over the past you know 10 days or whatever so and yeah this was the the revelation i always do kind of hope that with these festivals you get the one film where you just like yeah. get blown away um and this was it for me and it's funny because i was there with my partner liam and he he had a completely different experience of watching the film he came out of it and was not did mm. not get into it but mm. um yeah just in case people don't know it's it's been touted as a Frankenstein-ish tale and it just start off like that it's about a young woman played by Emma Stone who has been reanimated by this mad scientist played by Willem Dafoe and he lives in it's, it's set in the Victorian era and it's he lives in this kind of house in London but it or it, it's basically like a mad scientist's lab and the whole like de like the production design of the film is incredible. It's all like it looks like body parts. There's like ear ridges and everything on on the roof and at roof and uh, the walls and yeah. So it's he's this mad scientist and also running around is like I think it's a it's a duck's head with a dog's body. So he's been doing all these experiments. But him himself, um, he's he's called Godwin Baxter. And so uh, Emma Stone's character keeps referring to him as God because, of course, he's created her. Um, but he was also experimented on by his father. So he has this quite grotesque appearance as well. And so he has reanimated Emma Stone, who is called Bella. And so you see her at the beginning of the film and she's very much like a baby. She waddles around like a toddler and she's starting to learn speech um and so she's rapidly she's rapidly developing though so at first she's she's there she's walking around the house um godwin is assisted by this young doctor who of course she's enchanting to everyone because you know there's nothing more uh, i guess enchanting than a beautiful woman who doesn't really know how to speak or walk around it's it's like the ultimate kind of sexy baby and of course, and so everyone's kind of entranced by her, especially this young doctor. But she, at one point, she's uh, left alone by herself. She's she's eating. She has there's an apple. It's all very biblical, and she starts to, I don't know, use use the apple in a way that maybe it wasn't intended. And she has her first orgasm. And so then suddenly, this whole other part of life is being opened up to her. And alongside that. She starts looking outside and getting curious about the outside world. And in comes in Mark Ruffalo in this amazingly like over the top but, and buffoonish, but just really hilarious performance as this lawyer. And of course he sees Bella and he's like, oh yeah, I'll have some of that. And then he manages to kind of take her away. And then it becomes this the journey of Bella across different parts of Europe as she's starting to yeah, grow and change. Um, and at first, you know, her and Mark Ruffalo's character, they're just um, what she calls furious jumping. They're furiously jumping with each other, shagging endlessly. Um, but then she starts to meet other people. She meets um, two people on, on her journey. Um, the very, the weirdest duo of um, Hannah Scheigler, I can't say her name, Fassbinder, she was in a lot of Fassbinder films, um, and the comedian Jared, Jared Carmichael. And there, and they kind of introduce her to the world of the mind of reading, but Jared Carmichael, he also has almost quite a nihilistic view. And so he's kind of showing her, she's kind of being overwhelmed by the wonder of the world of the outside world but he starts to show her a bit of the dark side and then she ends up um at one point in paris and her and mark ruffalo he's he's starting to kind of go off her a bit 
um, because yeah, she's speaking her mind don't, now. Don't but, tell the whole. I haven't seen it yet. Don't tell me the whole. Okay, thing. yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. Anyway, um, yeah. So it just it just goes on, and uh, it's just this. You're seeing her like reacting to the world around. She's learning more and more about the world, and it's. it's why? Why do you think your partner partner didn't take to it? Is it well, a question he, of he, uh, visual taste, or uh, I, I? I mean, you. You know, it can often happen, can't it? But uh, I'm always amazed that two people can come out of the cinema and agree on something, um, yeah. in a way. But uh, wh what what was the uh, counter argument? Well, um, well, it's a Yorgos Lanthimos film, and yes. uh, he's definitely an acquired taste. So it's it's maybe not as pessimistic as his other films because there's a bit more joyousness in this film compared to his other films. Um, but uh, especially in the first part with with Willem Dafoe's character, it's just, I mean, Lanthimos loves his fisheye lenses and there's just like all these different shots. And I think it, and we were just talking about drawing attention to yourself. The style in this film, especially in the first part, is absolutely drawing attention to itself. It's like one shot to the next, it's going to fisheye to yeah extreme close-up to all sorts of things it's it's a lot of, uh, mostly in black and white at the beginning and then it becomes color um it's just yeah it's the style is very much in your face and so I think that can be yeah you can either like I love all of that I'm like yeah we're into the kind of over over simulation yeah, yeah, yeah. but I but I think my my partner he had the complete reaction where he it kind of irritated him it was like, just let me enjoy the story. Just let me enjoy the characters. Why are you constantly just changing the style up so much? Yeah, it's definitely yeah. So if 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 yeah, if you if you're not into that, then it can be I think uh, actually distance you from it rather than draw you in. And and this use of style by the film director um, is it in sync with the story and with the development of the character? Why, why does he choose to um, film this way? In your opinion, um, I don't know. I think I think it was. I mean, it, it, the first part, which is all very kind of mad scientist like, it was. I remember it was making me think of like expressionist films. I, I, I did read the other day that the the tone of the film was was, uh, or someone uh, someone um, justified it by saying it was it was the tone of the book. In, in, mm -hmm. a, in a sense mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. so maybe there is that anarchic sense in the book I, I don't know mm. and it's, I think maybe there's like the Frankenstein aspect of bits being put mm. together and something mm. else being mm. created mm. out of it and it seems it's it's interesting that there seems to be quite a lot of Frankenstein I'm pretending that I'm not in in a, on this call with someone who's written one of the greatest <laughs> kind of Frankenstein <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, but there is a lot of Frankenstein because I also saw at the cinema Birth Rebirth, mm. which oh, yes, is yes. really it's also a really really good film. Um, and it's and in that you have uh, it's very much about these two women, and in that you have a woman scientist who is creating life, and she's kind of using her body and her ability to yeah become pregnant, but in a completely but, uh, but it's really interesting way. that you mention those two uh, together because mm. it's kind of like you. You can go either way. I'm not talking about the horror genre specifically, mm -hmm. but but an idea, say the Frankenstein idea. Do you go mm -hmm. uh, down the alle allegorical, mythic, um, symbolic mm -hmm. kind of uh, route, in which case you have poor poor things, uh, mm -hmm. and it's kind of larger than life, or, or do you go, which I imagine is the other one, which is towards mm -hmm. what would happen if this was really happening? Yeah, um, mm -hmm. I'm not saying it's a documentary, but I'm saying it's more towards a uh, what would really happen than 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 poor Definitely. things? Definitely, you know, because uh, it... birth through birth through birth is very much contemporary set, and it's and it's there's a lot of debates almost about the difference between science and medicine hmm. because it's got the two main female characters is this scientist, but then also this woman who's lost her child, but she's also a nurse, so they're hmm. kind of two different approaches but listen can i ask you because it looked so intriguing in the trailer um that one sorry we're going away from your chosen film now but it's <laughs> relevant uh, um uh, even the trailer which i thought oh god this is interesting this is really interesting this is super interesting i can't wait to see this and then even in the trailer they have some shots that i found 
a bit over the top of the monstrous child type stuff and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So did you feel it kind of bottled out in the end into more a conventional horror movie or did it work as a whole for you? Uh, I'm talking I, about birth, birth, rebirth, obviously, no? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it managed to keep it together. I'm trying to remember. It's a few months ago because, uh, again, I was seeing it in the flurry of all the Oh, stuff. I know that feeling, yeah, yeah. They sometimes they're, they're, merge in your I'm mind. I'm putting you on the spot, sorry. Yeah, no, I I, 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 I remember coming out of it thinking that it that it did keep it together and it was going in some, into some really kind of interesting places i guess it it mostly manages to ground it but yeah maybe towards the end it might go into more generic horror but i think it manages to kind of not go too far with that but i imagine poor things even though it's based on frankenstein isn't really isn't really a horror film is it it's a it's a no or something or uh what how would you describe no it? it's very much a it's a comedy i think All right, okay. because <laughs> Because once she leaves the house, and it's very, it's interesting because it's made by Yorgos Lanthimos, who of course made Dog Tooth, and which was all about the yeah. parents wanting to keep the children and how kind of perverted that becomes. And uh, and at and at the beginning, um, the Willem Dafoe character he doesn't want her to leave because he's like, oh, you know, there's danger outside, and she wants to go. And so in in Poor Things, it's she's actually able to leave. And in many ways, it it, it becomes a, it's a good thing that she leaves. Um, but yeah, so there's this interesting. It it, it it definitely I think sits with a lot of other Lanthimos's films. He's always like I think he also of Killing of a Sacred Deer, which also has this kind of strange family set up, and it's all kind of contained in this house. Whereas uh, Poor Things, it almost becomes, it goes from like Frankenstein to kind of Candide. It becomes this kind mm, of picaresque mm. journey of her going from place to place. Mm. Um, and so it's, I think it's, yeah, like I said before, it's not as pessimistic as I find a lot of other Lanthimos' films. I think there's a lot more joy. And so I've, I know, it's, yeah, it's very, very funny. The music is also kind of insane, which also really fits with it. And it's, it's very much a, it's very much about the style, the costumes. I mentioned the production design. It's all very much coming back to the body, hmm. and 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 I guess almost like the the joy of we have these bodies and minds, and it's kind of reminding us of of you know maybe celebrating that. So it's a very it's a very kind of uh, tonally I feel very very different to um, other Lanthimos films, which I'm assuming maybe comes from the book, which I've uh. read. I haven't seen the film, um, but I'm very interested in what you're saying concerning the Frankensteinian aspect of it, especially because it seems that the monster here is a woman. Um, and uh, I was wondering if you would describe it as a, a feminist movie in its message. And uh, I, I'm also thinking about the um, you know, the relationship with the film we've just discussed, um, uh, Full Circle, because in Full Circle, you also have um, a woman who is being entrapped by a husband via um, um, mental health issues. Uh, so I've got the feeling that in both you have this sort of um, doctor who's trying to uh, keep uh, the woman under control in a way. Uh, am I correct in saying this? Uh, well, I think what the what are the really refreshing things about Four Things was that it's a film where a woman is discovering her sexuality exploring it and isn't ever really punished for it which admittedly doesn't happen a lot especially you know some yeah so um i think you you, you could say you could say there's a feminist message that it is about because i think it does all go it the the statement is kind of making about you know that that as she becomes developed as she becomes more of herself and exploring the world in some ways you know it, the men find her less entrancing the more kind of a full human being she becomes um which is yeah it's 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 a thing yeah it sounds, it sounds like the history of the western world yes, <laughs> yes. as yeah. long as she's an object she's attractive but when she becomes mm. a human being she's less so right yeah, and less easy to control and yes. less just going to do what you want. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, that's definitely kind of aspect in the film that I that I really enjoyed. 
is, is, is it also an aspect this probably is not the main thing but it's also the, the, because in a way he's given birth to her and then the child mm. is out of control so it's mm. it's not mm. having control over your child to, uh, to another, yes yeah on another yeah. level and the film uh, uh, won the golden lion in venice right yeah so i think there is bit there is a bit of awards talk around it i think i think scorsese is gonna gonna um overshadow which also was an amazing film another another 8 a.m screening um that i went through but but um thoroughly enjoyed but uh, yeah so I, I think i think emma stone is phenomenal in it she's really really good um she, this is probably this is much better than than uh la la land okay. um but she's already won the oscar but i think i think it it may be it may be um nominated for things but i can see it being maybe a bit too odd and a bit too out there to really win a lot of things but maybe it'll get some uh, nominations and you, things you, so you, I, can, you can you can never totally predict though can you it's, no it's no Okay. I hope it just works because it sounds like such a feat of the imagination, and it would be mm. it would be nice, um, you know. Too too often the, the the awards go to kind of worthy worthy subjects, um, uh, and mm -hmm. not the most, uh, and not off not often enough the most kind of spellbinding or imaginative. Mm. Uh, and it would be nice to um, reward something that sounds completely cinematic um, yeah. as an experience, you know. Thank we'll you, see. Thank you, uh, thank you uh, Lindsay Alam. It was wonderful to chat with you today about the two films you've chosen for this special episode of After Images. Close your eyes. It's After Images. Welcome back yeah. to After Images, where we are joined by our guests from 2023. This is the third installment. We're so happy to be chatting with Harley Payton and Amber Sparks. Thanks so much for joining us again. Pleasure. Yeah, happy to be here. So we're joined by um, Amber Sparks, who's uh, an author, writer, and by Harley Payton, who's a television producer and writer. And we're going to begin with uh, Amber Sparks, uh, who wants to tell us, I think, about the Twilight Zone. Huh. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I will. Uh, I guess I'll just talk about it, and then I guess do you are you guys going to jump in with questions and all that good stuff? Okay, great, perfect. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So you know, a few. Uh, I, I want to say like five or six years ago. Um, my husband and I got as I think a Christmas present, uh, the Blu-ray set of um, the Twilight Zone, all the seasons of the Twilight Zone in its entirety, which is a favorite show of ours. And we were very excited about that. Um, and then uh, the pandemic hit. And for some reason, we were like, we can't, we just can't watch this. It's it's just too bleak, right? Um, which is funny, because then what we chose to watch instead was like, Bojack Horseman and Six Feet Under and a bunch of other shows that are like incredibly bleak, um, but in a different way, right? I think I think uh, Twilight Zone is, has much more of a um, uh, a bleak view at times of society as opposed to the individual, although it can be both. Um, and so so finally we 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 were kind of going through all of our 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 blu-rays we're like a lot of people big physical media people so we're like oh my god we have so much stuff to watch what are we going to do and we found the twilight zone set and went you know it's probably time for our daughter to watch this um she is 8 uh, and that was about the age that my husband and I remembered, you know, watching it when we were kids uh, on TV, which was a very formative experience uh, for us, like a lot of people. Um, and uh, so we got out the the set and um, started watching it, all the episodes with her, uh, maybe like a month ago or something. Um, and we were very curious to see, you know, it's it's black and white. It's it's an older uh, TV show, and and you know, the production values in a lot of ways are older. So, and kids nowadays, right, have have don't always have the patience for that. Um, but she, from the very first episode, was completely hooked. Um, 
it helps that the first episode is very, very good. It's an iconic one. So um, the the where is everybody episode. Uh, um, so, you know, that was that was great. But it was nice, too, because um, uh, it's it's not that we didn't know or had forgotten. Uh, and I think most people know that Rod Sterling was very progressive for his time and um, very, you know, very socially progressive, right? Um, you know, had a lot. And so the the uh, series is full of anti-war messages and, um, you know, civil rights messages and um, and all these really interesting, you know, views that, of course, at the time were like pretty radical um and now are not so much although some of them sadly still are but um but that was that's been really neat too because a lot of times you know when you're watching older uh older films or tv shows with a, a kid you sort of have to be ready to do your like okay so let's stop it and talk about that for a second because that was that was how people were then and that this is a little weird um but we really you know haven't found that at all in the show because um it's it's so ahead of its time in so many ways so it's been a really a fun experience so far fantastic and could you share anything about the conversations that you've had with your daughter what is her response what kind of questions or topics does she discuss in response to the episodes yeah it's it's um she she's really enjoyed them she loves the I think probably like a lot of kids right the twist ending of 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 a lot of the episodes um that's sort of how they get you hooked uh um and it's but it's also uh, there's like a couple of episodes right in that first season that have the it was earth all along theme um and uh, so she, and she just loved that. She thought that was that was so cool. Um, and she kept talking about that. Uh, and um, you know, there's some of the episodes that she found. I think the ones that she probably found the most boring were the boxing episodes, <laughs> which there are a surprising number of. I'm like watching it again, and I'm like, I, and I know that was because Rod Serling had been a boxer and was very interested in the topic mm -hmm. of boxing. But it's like actually surprising how many boxing episodes are. Um, and some of them are they were great episodes, but obviously when you're an eight-year-old child, you're probably just like, I don't understand why I'm watching this thing about boxing. Um, but no, she and and it's surprising how much, even though there is a lot of complexity, um, and a lot of things are uh different because it was produced in the 1950s um and 60s she really just gets almost everything I mean a couple times she had to have a few things explained um but by and large it's actually a pretty easy show to understand um and sort of across time so she I think her favorite episode she told me so far was the um the eye of the beholder mm -hmm. which is of course the one where which is such an amazing episode and I actually wanted to talk a little bit about that because um because uh watching it through her eyes was very interesting this is the one uh where the woman is wearing the bandages and there's this discussion throughout the episode of when will the bandages come off and is she she's obviously having some kind of plastic surgery because she's um hideous right she's deformed in some way and she wants to look like everyone else and everyone's very pity like pities her and the, it's it's sort of we can we can tell it's this um uh sort of dictatorial society where um this you know people who look different have to go live somewhere else with their own kind they talk about a lot and then of course the twist at the end of the episode is we finally so throughout the episode we don't see anyone's face we don't see the doctor we don't see the nurses we don't see anyone but it's done in this very very masterful way where you really you sort of don't notice and mm. and when you do notice because the emphasis is on her and her viewpoint and continually she talks about seeing in the darkness of these bandages and this cool um cool shadows that she sees and 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 um sort of being in this cave-like world it's not that we actually think we're seeing through her eyes but somehow it feels like it's a metaphor for what she's seeing or it's it's um it's a visual interpretation so it sort of it doesn't feel like 
oh, what the heck? Why am I not seeing anyone's face? And then, of course, at the very end, you finally see everyone's face. And she's gorgeous um, and and like model gorgeous. And uh, all of the other people are pig people, I guess I would call it. You know, they have the, they the crazy noses. <laughs> yeah, the very odd features. Um, and, of course, the yeah, moral being the eye of the beholder. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Um, and, and it was something that really... Uh, was really interesting for me to watch and with her because she um what she took away from it as an eight-year-old is she's like wow I I never thought about that before and that's so interesting to think about like what if everybody else looked like this and you know would would we think we were ugly and it just like sent her mind on this tangent which mm. I think was really neat um and speaks to why I think so many writers I know Harley you mentioned it I think a lot of writers are were really really influenced by oh, yeah. uh the Twilight Zone because it does each episode does sign your send your mind on these tangents yes. of what if mm -hmm. um and but it was also fun for me to watch her watching it because um because I knew right I know the endings to these mm -hmm. these episodes I've seen them all many times if not for years um but uh, I, I'm watching how masterfully they did them the first time and realizing, oh, this isn't obvious. You know, it's like a lot of shows and things that have twist endings. You watch them a second or a third time and it's painfully obvious what they were doing. And um, you can't really rewatch them. But these tend to be very subtle in in the ways that information is, is doled out and clues are given throughout an episode. Um, and it feels very organic uh, so that the, that no matter how many times you see it, the ending always feels very earned. Hmm. It's always fascinating to um, have Amber on the podcast because um, she always discusses um, the films through the eyes of her daughter <laughs> about this uh, idea of transmission, <laughs> mediation. And I find that so interesting to... Uh, um, because, I mean, the Twilight Zone, uh, I guess, was so important to all of us uh, during our childhood or when we grew up, when we developed, but we received it firsthand. But in your case, you are mediating this to your daughter, and this process of transmission is fascinating, I think. Yeah, We're yeah. No, by no, this no. next generation of cinephile that, that you're raising, Amber. Thank you so yeah. much. <laughs> you might, might be strange, but we'll see. Oh, I think it's a good kind of strange for sure. <laughs> um, and Harley, what about you? Would you like to respond to the Twilight Zone? Anything that well, comes? Just, I, I think as a writer, and I said to you earlier, his daughter has a Twitter account. And I think I did say to her that it, it, those shows are the reason I do what I do, I think. I mean, I think they just opened your mind in a way. And, the, and Twilight Zone episodes are in the DNA of so many things that we're watching now. Um, the whole it was Earth all along trope. I mean, hello, Planet of the Apes. No spoilers. Um, you know, remember Odyssey of Flight 33, where the plane goes into a different, you know, that became manifest. Um, and even Sam Esmail's movie, which just came out, reminds me of the monsters are doing Maple Street, which and that's a, an amazing episode. So, yeah, it's <clears throat> I don't think there's anything really like it. I mean, it's it, and a lot of this depends on what as I go to bed at night, sometimes it's just what's on the weird me TV channel. And lately it's been Twilight Zone followed by the Albert Hitchcock show uh -huh. and those two things back to back. And mm -hmm. every actor you've ever seen like Robert Redford played deaf, you know, on Twilight Zone, right? Mm -hmm. In another wonderful episode. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's um, it's it's hard for me to think of a more important show in terms of its impact on the way people make television, even today. And it was so varied, right? It was dealing with horror, science fiction, suspense, mystery. It was all each time very different, uh, but at the, at the same, very different. But at the same time, there was always this under layer of a message of uh, a social message or political yeah. message that was there and they did straight up comedy episodes yes i mean they did much in the way that i think um x files would kind of oh here's a funny x files and sometimes those are some of my favorites and mm. you know that's and you know twice i do the same thing mm. Uh, what, what about the other series, uh, the one, um, the ones from the eighties, the two thousands, or new, the newer one uh, by Jordan? <clears throat> uh, have you seen those? Um, do you like those? If you have, and what about the film too? There was a film made in the nineteen eighties. 
yeah, the film has its own uh, uh, horrible uh, story. Yeah, terrible story around it. Um, yeah, I did. I did see some of the ones from the eighties. I rem I remember I watched a lot of those too when I was a kid. Like, there's this one that will stick in my mind forever about a. I don't remember the name of it, but it was a girl who like exchanges her parents she's like angry at her parents so she like goes to the store and like gets new parents basically mm. and it's like it's like for for a kid it was terrifying mm. um so yeah, i did see some of those they weren't as iconic for the most part there was a few really good ones um and of course the i did see the film um not even that long ago because i uh right. i was like morbidly curious um and <clears throat> I'm not seen the most recent uh twilight of uh, twilight zone series i i i remember oh, jordan some... peele as host hmm. yeah yeah i haven't seen it yet is I mean, it, yeah is it i good? tried i i feel like if i'm gonna watch a twilight zone show now i'd rather watch black mirror than twilight zone hmm. <clears throat> that's, because that's another yeah, show probably. charlie booker i mean how obviously inspired that is hmm. um by yeah. the 12th so that's, yeah, that's a good going. point really bringing the the whole spin of the twilight zone into the 21st century with black mm -hmm. mirror yeah I'm glad you yeah did. that's it's really the, where you'll find it, the, the dystopian uh, aspect of uh, black mirror that really resonates with uh, the original twilight zone i think mm -hmm. yeah. yeah yeah very much very much mm -hmm. um but sterling was amazing and the directors who worked on that show i mean there was so much talent involved um yeah it's it's pretty special Thank you so much, uh, Amber, for having discussed uh, The Twilight Zone with us. Uh, we're moving to Holly Payton, who wants to tell us about an Australian TV series, I think. Yes. I mean, it's funny because when we were talking about, like, you know, what are my favorite shows of the year? And I always go to the same two, which is The Baron Reservation Dogs. And I think they're both absolutely extraordinary. But, but one thing I like about streaming is the surprises that can come your way. And even at a time when there's a lot of talk about, you know, streaming is falling apart and who knows what will happen. The promise was never really met. We don't have everything at our fingertips like we thought we would. But, you know, this Wolf, like, it's called Wolf Like Me. It, it, it ended up on a kind of year end list because my wife and I both sort of curate those lists to see what we've missed and what we should watch. And Wolf Like Me was on there. And it's an extraordinary show. First of all, and I don't know why this is, and maybe it's just me, but it's a half hour. And I, as you probably noticed from the Bear and Reservation Dogs, I, I like that length for a show. It just, it appeals to me. It's something that I can, you know, we, like we watched the last two Wolf Like Me's just last night. Um, and it's an Australian series created by a man named Abe Forsyth, who also directs every episode. Um, he's a single father. And apparently he found himself kind of drifting aimlessly around Los Angeles, going to meaningless general meetings with various studios. And this idea just came to him, which is what if I found a life partner who could help me raise my turbulent child? Oh, but they're also a werewolf. And, and for me, that's a kind of show that I just love because I love that kind of genre collision. I love when the collision involves a sense of humor. Um, that's why we talked about Buffy uh, for a, a great length earlier in the year. And so for me, it really has all of those things. And it's got a wonderful cast and not one that I would have expected, which is Josh Gad and Isla Fisher. And I've never really seen, I mean, Josh Gad's hilarious. We all know that. But he's a really wonderful dramatic actor in this. And, and what you have is this show that's both funny and despairing. Um, it's about grief. It's about connection. It's about the will to kind of rebuild something new out of the wreckage of your life. Um, and it's about all those things at the same time. Uh, but it's also about, do you share that really worst possible secret about yourself? And that's one of the reasons I love genre television anyway. It's, I mean, just, this will be my last Buffy reference. But, you know, Buffy kind of has a new boyfriend, sleeps with him for the first time. He turns out to be a monster. But on Buffy, he's literally a monster. It's not a metaphor. So... I've always loved that with genre, and I, and I think they do a very effective job of it here, where Isla Fisher has a secret, and every relationship is going to have secrets that are revealed or not revealed, and sometimes they're more problematic than others. And, and I think Forsyth did a wonderful job of creating both the world and the characters, but also one of the first things I, I look at in a writer's room, no matter what the show is, particularly dealing with genre, which is what is the actual daily experience of this thing? 
right? Like, what is it like to be a vampire? Really, honestly, what would it be like to be a werewolf? And he really dives into that in a really interesting way, whether it's about, you know, you've got a safe room in your basement for your werewolf, um, or how does the werewolf feed, or what do you do in the aftermath? And what happens, well, I don't want to do spoilers, but the fact of the matter is the second season ends on an unbelievable cliffhanger, and apparently it just came out, and I missed it at that time, last October. So, you know, everyone's hopeful for a third season that'll be coming. The other thing that Forsyth does, which I truly love, and I'm always envious because the show I'm running at the moment has no music budget, and that's his use of music. He uses music just brilliantly throughout every possible kind, and for, and interestingly enough, He's a real Queens of the Stone Age maniac. So their music plays a real central part to what this show is. And Josh Gad, who can sing a tune, actually sings a Crowded House song as a kind of soothing thing. They does Crowded House, of course, being a great Australian band. Um, I love the show. And, and I think it's a great love story, but it, but it but doesn't shy away from those issues. And one of them is, I don't know, do I really want to share my life with a werewolf? And not to mention my young daughter, and you know what happens if that safe room door unlocks by accident, right? Mm -hmm. And it's um, it really does a great job about that. And and it was a complete surprise to me. And we went through the first two seasons in just a couple of weeks because we just every night that's what we wanted to see. And and again, I can't say enough about Gad and Isla Fisher how good they both are. They're mm -hmm. very difficult parts, um, and it's and the the and they're both obviously very deft comedians. But the drama in the show is also really, really lovely. And and it's a, at the end of the day, it's a relationship show. You know, it's about these two people coming together and it's about his daughter in particular. And I do believe we're, in, we're living in the golden age of 12 year old actors. I mean, she's amazing. And, and so it, it really makes the show about so many things at the same time. And that's a difficult balancing act, but I think Forsyth does a wonderful job of it. And you know, it's it, it's a show that I think I did not see coming, which makes it even more fun for me. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that you saw the first episode recently, so you know, in a way, what I'm talking about. They're very clever about when they reveal, because it's, I read some Abe Fisher interviews. He knew they were going to have to do the American Werewolf in London moment. They were going to have to do a transformation. Mm -hmm. And so it's always a big question as to where you end up and how that works. And Buffy was just a big plushy doll that bounced around. You know, they didn't have a lot of money for their werewolf suit. But in this case, they waited and they waited and they kind of, they put it out piecemeal at first. So by the time you get to it, you're ready for it. And um, and they had a, apparently Forsyth's previous credit was a zombie movie. And so he was working with the same special effects people and makeup people. And uh, it's, it's really, really well done. Um, mm -hmm. And it's that humanoid sort of, wolf you know hybrid which is i think very difficult to pull off mm -hmm. it's funny i was actually talking to two young writers earlier in the week who were looking for someone to come in and sort of godfather a project they're doing and it was about a late night radio host who also turns out to be a werewolf but in, in their world the werewolf is just it's a wolf it's like mm -hmm. a big damn game of thrones wolf mm -hmm. right and for me that's that's kind of the easier way to go but they actually i think Forsyth pulls it off he's a very deaf director too I think he did a really great job with, you know, what can be difficult material. Um, and for some reason, a series of amazing car stunts, and I don't even know how they managed that to do is at the same time. Mm -hmm. But it's an enormously um, entertaining show. As I said before, very moving. And I, I don't want, you know, let me just put it this way. If someone does get pregnant and they're a werewolf, do they give birth to a wolf or a human child? Let's just say that that may or may not factor into the second season of the show. And it's, and it's, and that's something this is, and I love when people do things that I've never thought of before, mm -hmm. right? Like I still remember when I was reading a book at one point, I can't remember what the book was, but, but a horse turned into a zombie horse. It's like, Oh, zombie animals. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm interested in that. And so this, I think they managed to do here some things that I just didn't see coming and didn't think about. And so, you know, as a writer, that's the stuff you kind of sponge up. Um, but also just a, it's a viewer, it's what I want to see. Mm. Those are very much the, the sort of things that someone like Tim Powers does in his books. I mean, he always comes oh. up with uh, connections that um, um, one hasn't made before him. 
Uh, yeah. but, but yet the, the, that show is something of a supernatural humor humorous uh, rom-com and yeah. uh, while watching the the first episode uh, marissa and i were hmm, reginald the vampire yeah <laughs> there, there is no that's my tone that's what i love to do both to watch and to write mm. um i think it all stems from joss whedon and buffy i think mm. that was the first show that really nailed that mm. um and so we're, we all owe a debt to that and, and for me, yes, Reginald the Vampire is absolutely, I describe it as a workplace comedy, rom-com, vampire dramedy. And mm. sometimes we try all those tones in the same scene. It just depends. And and what, and actually, my wife, Deanna, had said to me, we need to watch Wolf Like Me because, because of the similarities to Reginald. Mm. That, that it's inspiring to see someone working in a world that's not dissimilar and doing such great work. Um, it's just it's inspiring to the point where you just have to be careful about theft. But I mean, I think that because but it's but being inspired like that is also such a thrill, and and seeing someone who is clearly working in a similar area to the one that I've been working in for the last two years. And I love what you said about streaming surprises too. That for all its shortcomings, we also have these wonderful surprises from other countries that may not absolutely. Have on our radar. Oh, no, absolutely. I have a list that I keep, my wife keeps removing it, but I have a list of shows. I mean, I can't tell you how long it is that I either want to watch currently. Sometimes we don't watch shows together. Sometimes we do. I mean, the ones just very quickly, I remember going to her and saying, hey, the last season of Breeders is on. Let's watch that. Season four. So we turn on the first episode of season four and realize we've never seen Breeders. That we are in fact confusing it with another British show called Trying, which was about a couple trying to adopt, mm. right? And Breeders is about a couple trying to survive. Mm. And it's a Martin Freeman show who everyone knows from the UK office and from actually Marvel movies. Um, but he created it and it's amazing. I mm. mean, it because he has created for himself a character who is frequently unlikable to a surprising degree. Right. And you can talk about, oh, this character has anchor management problems, but it's always ameliorated with a level of sympathy that allows for it to not be off putting. Mm. Martin Freeman does not give a fuck. Mm. I mean, his character in that show at times and it's four seasons and they go through these kids, you know, being eight and five and then being 18 and 15. And it's it's a beautiful show. And, and again, one of those surprises that I just, you know, it's a UK show that it ended up on Hulu. And so I ended up watching it. And that to me, that is the kind of promise of streaming, which yes, has been broken over and over again. I mean, Andre Brower tragically died this week. Homicide Life on the Streets is not available in streaming. Mm-hmm. You can't watch it anywhere, mm-hmm. right? I, I, I'm betting over music rights problems, but you you know, and so that always drives me a little crazy. But um, yeah, Breeders and, uh, and Wolf Like Me are two shows that I really love this year. Mm-hmm. And it's amazing how many um, fascinating shows come from Britain, but from Australia. I'm, I'm always surprised by the amount of uh, really wonderful TV series that come from a country that doesn't have such a huge population, actually, and they are very, very creative on that front. Yeah, the British shows are, you know, a goldmine. I mean, there's and there's every kind of show. They remade the show Pull Dark, which I ended mm-hmm. up loving. Um, Being Human is a wonderful British show. A lot of these shows get remade here and they're not as good, mm. <clears throat> whether it's the slap out of Australia or something like Being Human, which was originally in the UK. I mean, Skins, one of my, I think one of the best shows of the century, the UK mm. version of Skins is quite amazing. The mm. American version, less so, although oddly enough, done by the same people. Mm. Um, but yeah, that's one of the great things about streaming. Netflix in particular is crazy about Korean shows and you can get a lot of really cool stuff that way. I used to go out and try to find the dvds with hard-coded you know subs subtitles and i had to buy a region-free dvd player Mm -hmm. i thought i was well ahead of the curve um now you can just turn that on to netflix and of course it's cheaper for them so i'm assuming Mm -hmm. they'll do it more Mm um amber do you know these shows have you seen uh, either of those i have not um Although I feel like I have to watch Wolf Like Me now because uh, my husband and I are both huge uh, werewolf uh, oh, awesome. fans, horror movie fans in general, and uh, yeah. and and especially my husband. You know, the, I, when you said humanoid uh, werewolf, I was like, oh, ooh, because we we yeah. love like the howling and like that. You know, oh yeah. No, you'll werewolf. love. Oh, good. Then that's 
that's the best thing I've done today is get because you'll love that. It's just <laughs> such a good show. Um, yeah. And I'm telling everyone I know about it because, again, I don't think anyone I know had even heard of it. Yeah. Mm. I had not. It's so, just, yeah, yeah, because streaming, it's just there's so many things out there mm. that it's impossible to know what's going on sometimes. Mm. You've converted the three of us, and now hopefully <laughs> more <laughs> listeners will check it out as well. <clears throat> exactly. That's, that's my and, goal. Uh, and I hope that our listeners will think about revisiting the Twilight Zone as well, if they haven't already oh. done so, because it is just such a formative show that everyone needs to watch and rewatch. Yeah, it's a bottomless pit, isn't it? I mean, like, uh, we can come back to it over and over again, and there's always something new to find there. Yeah, people ask that question, what, what's, what have you seen more times, you know, have you repeated viewing of more than anything else? And I start to say Blade Runner because I've seen the movie a ridiculous number of times. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, it's Twilight Zone episodes. Mm. You know, what? because I, again, I'll start, oh, there's the Billy Mummy one where he's going to put him in the cornfield. I think mm. I have to watch this now, right? Mm. And it's, just, it's, you know, and there's, you know, then there's the ones that I haven't seen that many times. Mm. So it, yeah. it's just, it, yeah, it, it is a huge resource and um, <clears throat> and is available in streaming, thank goodness, every season, so. Yeah, so we've actually yeah. found a show that Holly Payton has watched more times than Buffy. <laughs> you know what? It's a close one. It is close. It is close. Um, Buffy plays on a channel here almost 24-7. My wife no longer allows me to have it playing in a room that she's in because she finds it too obsessive. Um, but you're right. Those are that would be the that would be the other uh, possibility when it comes to answering that question. And it was really fun for this um, third installment that the two of you both uh, proposed to talk about television series, because that's also something oh, really near and dear to our hearts here on the podcast, yeah. which is to put on equal footing television and films that have been released in oh, cinema absolutely. or on DVD, because of course, both uh, we respect as an art form of moving images. And so we were really, really happy yeah. to include several great series, um, both old and new in this uh, episode. No, mm. awesome. I mean, separating them is like saying that short stories should be in a different building from novels. I mean, <laughs> does it oh, make exactly, sense? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> As a short story writer, you know, I, I have feelings uh -huh. about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I bet. Thank you so much uh, <laughs> for having accepted to come back on the show tonight. I mean, tonight, um, European time. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's yeah. been wonderful to have the two of you. Um, and um, well, this is the end of the third segment of our podcast, Marisa. Awesome. Yeah. I love talking to you guys. So it was a pleasure to be here. Oh, yeah. thanks. So much. Thank Always a so pleasure much. to speak with both of you. And I hope that your end of the year is surrounded by great films, series, books, and art. Thank you for listening to After Images. Please subscribe on your favorite podcast app and follow After Images podcast on social media. After Images.